Okay, uh, Mark, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the 2022 Next Gen Train Control Conference being held in Philadelphia. Uh, neither you or I could be there, uh, so we're in the UK, and it was a great opportunity so we could hear from you to talk to you about Crossrail. So can you just give us a quick background uh, about yourself and how you ended up at Crossrail for us? Well, thanks, uh, Mike. Thanks, everybody. I wish I was there in person with you. So I, I'm an electrical engineer. First 15 years of my career were in utilities, then 22 years in railways. Done some interesting stuff. Uh, commissioned the Victoria Line, commissioned the Downtown Line in Singapore, uh, ran all the public transportation in the state of Victoria, was the managing director of London Underground. Then I ended up in the seat of the CEO of Crossrail, the big construction project in the UK that created the Elizabeth Line. I've uh, subsequently left and I'm now in the uh, great seat of CEO of SGN, who are one of the biggest gas distribution utilities in the UK. So I'm back in the energy sector now. Right. I think that's a common was six months, wasn't it? From managing director of LU? Yeah, it was. I was on the, I'm not blameless for those of you who know that Crossrail had some trouble in 2018. It was only meant to be for 16 months, but I, I was on the board of Crossrail. So I guess I've got a good insight about why it got into trouble and yeah i ended up being there for nearly four years uh with uh, working for andy byford to get the uh, to get the railway open which we did on the 23rd of may this year okay so it was <clears throat> planned in 2007 we worked started in 2009 you joined in 2018 towards the end and you then handed over to a tfl in may 2021 22 22 yeah. um we're not going to get into the cost overruns and the time overruns. Perhaps we'll touch on it at the end because this is a technical conference and people can Google the, 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 that, that story. But um, can you just talk a bit about the Elizabeth line from a signaling point of view, just the geography of the line from where to where and, 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 and the types of signaling that are going to be in use on it? Yeah, so the Elizabeth line is um, a very important project in the UK and London. For those of you who know other railways, it's very similar to the RER in Paris or S-Bahn in Germany. It's not a tube line, it's a full size, 100 kilometer an hour, 25 kV overhead line, uh, big suburban train. And what the Elizabeth Line's doing is it's joining the Great Eastern Railway, which obviously runs out to the east from London, to the Great Western, which extends all the way out to the West Country in the UK and of course connects to our international hub of Heathrow. So the, the bridge underneath London that is the Elizabeth Line, this brand new railway uh, joins together two historic Victorian railway systems, the Great Western and the Great Eastern. Uh, Elizabeth Line was planned in the 40s, the 1840s, when after the Liverpool-Manchester Railway, the canal companies thought these underground railways might actually catch on. So obviously since then it's taken many years of planning. And as you say, Mike, the Elizabeth line has taken 23 years of planning and actual construction to deliver. Although the bill was passed in 2007, there'd already been eight years worth of work on Crossrail and the Elizabeth line. And the point is to join two historic railways together. It boosts London's transport capacity by 10% in one boost, brings um, 1.5 million people within a commutable distance of London, extra compared to now, and crucially, shreds journey time you know paddington to liverpool street becomes a 10 minute journey rather than the 23 24 minutes that it might take you know so i think there are about seventy five thousand people who worked on crossroad in total yeah yeah i'm one of a um, very lucky person to be person at the end but seventy five thousand people worked on it and uh you know generally a uk initiative but people from all over the world of course you know our signaling system came from a uh, branch from siemens in germany the trains were built in Derby in the UK, but the ETCS system came from Mannerheim, uh, from the old Bombardier RCS organisation. So yeah, a UK effort, but a genuine global coalition. And I think the construction ran late. Um, for those of you who don't realise, in London, every time you build a new underground line, it has to go deeper than everything else to get that horizontal alignment. But there were some delays with construction before you could even start fitting the signalling systems. Yeah, I mean, Crossrail broke a few fundamental laws of railways in a push to get the railway open by December 2018. I think everybody recognises now defining a singular end date to be the internal challenge 
and the external relied upon date was a, a crazy idea, really. So I think, you know, driving for an unrealistic um, opening date was one of the big problems in Crossrail. And in 2018, we had, there's no way two ways of putting it, we had a black hole in the project of quite a considerable gap. The team thought they had six to nine months to go. The reality was we had three or four years to go. And, and you're right, Mike, it wasn't all about the signaling systems. Uh, even if the signaling and trend control systems had been on time, the, um, there, was a, there was a lag with the construction and the fit out anywhere. But, you know, many critical paths compounded on uh, cross rails. But, you know, the signaling system was one of them, undoubtedly. So let's talk about signaling systems. You connected the railways to the west and the railways to the east of London. And through the centre, you built the tunnel. So you have four different signalling systems, really, effectively. Uh, AWS and TPWS, which are older systems in the UK, similar to, to positive train control uh, in the States. Um, you have ETCS level two on the Heathrow extension, which is owned by Heathrow Airport itself, and you implemented CBTC through the central section. So you've now got four systems, three, four systems on the train. You've got to test them individually. You've got to integrate them into the train and you've got to give the driver something that makes sense in terms of a, yeah. you know, a, a control screen and, and make it possible for them to do that migration on the fly. Um, we know how we ended up with the four. Through the system design and the installation and the testing and the integration of the signaling, what were the issues that you came up against that you really had to um, sort out? Yeah, I think it, it is worth unpacking why we ended up with four signaling systems. And it's a story I think that would um, be interesting to this audience about uncertainty. So these decisions were made in 2007, 2008 not just the signaling system, but Crossrail is undoubtedly one of the most advanced digital railways in the world. Probably in the world we might be able to understand and see, it's probably the most complex digital railway system in the world. And if you go back to 2007, the reason we have a CBTC, automatic train operation, GOA level two in the center, is at that time ETCS with ATO and with platform screen doors was considered to be highly novel. So the decision was made, instead of having ETCS level two all the way through with ATO interfacing with the platform screen doors, decision was made to use the, what you might say, proven technology of CBTC in London, which had that point had um, the Jubilee line was well advanced. Uh, the Victoria line had had a variant of CBTC for many, many years. And of course, when you look back on it, it's quite interesting that in reality now we do have ETCS level two with ATO. And I think probably some in the world they're probably connected to a platform screen door. So I believe a better decision would have been three signaling systems with ETCS all the way through. But I wouldn't criticize the people at the beginning because you know they, they made a reasoned decision. Uh, the challenge of course that gave it was Siemens were the provider of the CBTC in the middle, Bombardier, now Alstom, with the provider of the train and the uh, Alstom with the ETCS vendor in, in the Heathrow Tunnel with the RBC. So we had many, many um, actors on the stage, you know, including Norbrems, who were the uh, platform screen door manufacturer, a, a local company to, to London made the tunnel ventilation system. And the biggest single challenge was the integration of the individual systems to make a whole that was operable. You know, 2,000 women and men, brilliant people, operate the Elizabeth line. In amongst that, there are, I think, 600 drivers and some really big technological challenges. It's a single driver uh, information system, a single DMI. The signaling systems, east and west, transition on the fly without a stop and a kind of, you know, a master control switch. So auto reverse at one end is, is in the place which, you know, is used elsewhere in the world, but certainly in the UK. A mainline train having auto reverse functionality is, is very, very novel. So all of these compounding effects added to the immense digitization gave Crossrail an immense uh, integration challenge, Mike, uh, no, no doubt about it. So Paddington is the auto turn back with two sidings, I think, and yeah. it's going to be a 24 trains an hour service, so a train every two and a half minutes, and to achieve that sort of turnaround, with pretty much every other train going around the Paddington, you've got to have that auto turn back. I remember when ETCS and ERTMS was first introduced in the UK on the Cambrian line by Ansaldo, 
now we're all over time engineered out grade crossings because trying to integrate grade crossings into ETCS and that was 15 years ago or whatever was a problem and it sounds like the thing is there actually a migration path for the non ETCS sections to go to ETCS without a major rehash of the software yeah so one of the good question that so one of the fundamentals of Crossrail is that it's built for a, it's future proofed you might want to say so if you take the Great Western that comes into the Paddington throat, there is actually a plan from our network rail, who are the you know the, the national provider of the infrastructure to bring ETCS all the way in. So actually the migration to ETCS level two should be relatively simple. Um, the rule sets are in there. You know, the most difficult thing I think about ETCS coming into the Paddington throat, Mike, will be the, the switching speed that's required to get the trains in and out. But I think there's, you know, when I was, I used to run Westinghouse uh, Signaling Company at the time, this is kind of 15 years ago, uh, we were always worried about the switching speed of ETCS. I think they're probably kind of solved now, to be honest. So yeah, there's, there is a clear migration path all the way through. So when you say switching speed, is that the frequencies at which it operates or the speed the driver has to do the switch without invoking an EB or something? Now, switching speed in ETCS is all about the, the, the small periods of time in the decision making between all of the systems. And uh, coming out of the Paddington throat, the uh, the conventional solid state interlockings are very very fast. So I think, but I think these issues are solved. So to answer your question, the Elizabeth line is built for a, a very long term scalable future. I mean, I think what's interesting though, Mike, is um, for everybody listening, the before I arrived, and I'm not criticizing anybody. We thought the software might jump in about five increments. You know, even in my time in Crossrail, we've probably had 50 increments of software, 50. So we've kind of climbed Mount Everest 10 meters at a time. And the idea of jumping up, uh, particularly when you're at the you know, immense reliability growth challenges that we've had was kind of a bit flawed. So I think migration, yes, but it's always going to be very, very incremental. That's the kind of a big learning from Crossrail. Five, five is really naive. If you think <laughs> all the patches and, and all the updates and just that software can pick up, great if it was to only have five software updates. How about the suppliers? You touched on Siemens and you touched on Bombardier, now Alstom, as the train provider. How did you find the two companies working together? Because I think it's a good thing because they're forced together. I think there's a, a, a misunderstanding in the industry that says if you buy your signaling and your trains from the same supplier, it's going to be fine because they're not in the same place and they don't talk to each other. I mean, I, I agree. I would. Uh, by the way, if you buy this, if you buy a bundled up package, I think you're going to be fine. But generally, my preference is always for a different, a different train manufacturer to a different signaler, because you 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 are forced to to flush out the interdependencies. You know, who, who owned the integration? Did Crossrail own it, uh, or did yeah, you make money on the prime? No, one of the big Crossrail was always the system integrator, and one of the reasons that we fell into a black hole was although Crossrail, this is one of the most profound lessons of Crossrail, Crossrail thought it was in a highly collaborative environment. And collaboration to me was necessary, but not sufficient. And Crossrail, although Crossrail was the system integrator, it took a relatively light touch before I arrived between Siemens and at that time Bombardier. The game changed with a guy called Danny DePerna, who some of you will know. Danny DePerna was the president of Bombardier, now the chief operating officer of Alstom. And he introduced us to a concept of the plateau. And the plateau was kind of what they would use in building a jet engine. And a plateau is beyond the collaborative environment. And it's into a space where you might say owning the whole, W-H-O-L-E, owning the whole, where everybody involved in the plateau, which included the train drivers, the instructor operators, the signalers, everybody was in a common spirit of resolving the problem together rather than in a loose collaborative environment where eventually contractual arrangements come. So the Danny DePerna in the plateau completely changed our game. And it's the only way that Crossrail's got delivered, I think, in the end of the day. So that's really interesting because um, a number of US agencies are either giving it to the rolling stock supplier or the signal supplier to effectively be the prime on integration. And I don't think that's right, because ultimately the agency is going to get involved, whether you like it or not. If they start fighting, they start taking each other to court. You know, the agency still got to get, get in there and sort of, and, and own the integration. Yeah, I've done, a, I've done 155 Crossrail Lessons Learned sessions in the past 18 months. 
And my two, my two greatest hits, I'll give you my two greatest hits. Firstly, minimize complexity at all costs, <laughs> simplify. But actually, some things are inherently complex, trend control and signaling one. And where complexity exists, the client must increase its coordination. So as complexity increases, so does the need for the client to coordinate, is my big learning of Crossrail. And I am very anti giving the integration authority to a rolling stock manufacturer or a, a signaling manufacturer. I, I really passionately believe the client should hold the hold the, the kind of ring on um, on integration. And uh, yeah, I think it's a mistake, Mike, that you see made, being made quite, quite a lot, yeah. And you said, so there were two lessons you, you would pass on. One was around- Simplicity. Owning the, simplicity and owning the integration. Simplicity, then if you can't simplify and things are complex, the client has to increase its coordination. On Crossrail, uh, neither thing happened. Um, they, they didn't simplify enough. So a lot of modularity that could have been done was lost. So the thing was overtly complex. And even in that complexity, the Crossrail client took an approach of a light touch, a light touch, assuming the supply chain, not just train control, you know, it was in the fire engineering and the, the digital integration of the SCADA, all other areas, the client took a light touch, assuming the world-class supply chain that we had, we had the best in the world. But even the best in the world, as you say, Mike, couldn't do the job of the client, which was to pull people in to something purposefully that's bigger than, you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. I, I just don't think you can have a light touch on something as complex oh. as that. One of my last questions, and you've taken it nicely, is there anything you would say to train and signaling suppliers or to signaling suppliers that you learn from that for them to take away as a lesson learned for their own companies? Oh, absolutely. Um, two, two, two fundamental things. I, I speak as a former leader of a signaling company that eventually ended up in operations. You know, I, uh, Mike makes a great operator, I know. I'm always in awe of operators. So I, I've kind of, but I could say at least I have operated something. So I think, <laughs> I would think the first thing I would say to signaling companies is they've got to understand the operations first. And it's, it's okay to have the voice of the operator at the beginning, but they've got to be influential. And what happened in Crossrail was the, vo the operator was there at the beginning, the shadow operator, but at every turn, the thing that got compromised and squashed and mitigated was the operator because they were 10 years away. So my big learning of um, signaling and train control companies is take very, very seriously what operators say at the beginning. And once you have the source of that, modularize, modularize, modularize. And Crossrail did the opposite. It paid lip service at the beginning to the operators and it refused to modularize. So you ended up at the end with the operators having great difficulty absorbing the operation. And this is a cultural issue at the beginning of programs, yeah? Well, listen, thanks for speaking up to operators. I'll give you the 20 bucks uh, afterwards. Uh, as we as we come to a close, uh, well, you're saying that. I, I My favorite presentation I give is 10 Golden Rules on Brownfield CBCT resignaling projects. And I've done three now on the Greenfield. And, um, in my top 10 things to do. One is around the Vanguard team, having the operator in early hmm. and throughout. And so all of that detail gets screwed down and you haven't got to go back later on and have scope creep. And I mean, really just to finish, and we talked earlier about the overrun and we talked about the cost overrun and the time overrun. The three pillars of a project are time, cost, quality, brackets, scope. And for me, it has to be quality. If you run late on a project, people will forgive you once it's open and say, wow, it's amazing. If you spend a few billion extra, the money's paid up and people forgive you. But if the quality is not there, you're living with that for the next 30 years. And that's what some people forget in rail projects, even in the public sector, where we have to be careful with the public purse. The quality has to count for the reliability and for the customer experience. Listen, we're at the end of the time, um, Mark, thanks ever so much for the uh, chat. Hopefully there's some takeaways for you at the conference uh, for projects you're working on in the US, Canada and further afield. Um, I assume that Bill has finished his afternoon siesta and I'll hand back to you. Are you there, Bill?